This is the second studio hosted by the Architecture and a Design Office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Boradero Ney. This week it's the two of us in the studio, and we are doing a long awaited project companion episode. And this week we are talking about uh, some of our favorite pet peeves in architecture and design, and uh, oftentimes houses, but just architecture and design in general. And um, we had a list of 10 that we brainstormed it was beforehand. Ambitious. Yeah. We only got through four, uh, which is totally fine. So uh, I guess we'll do another recording in the future on this. Um, and that's it. That's it. That's the recording, right? That's it. Should we yeah. give an overview of the pet peeves? No, let's keep oh, okay. it suspenseful. Suspenseful. Sponsors. Designers and architects, if you're looking for a powerful and real-time visualization and VR tool, then check out Enscape. Why is Enscape special? Well, it's super easy to use because it's a plugin and not a standalone application, which means you can work directly in your SketchUp, Rhino, ARCHICAD, Vectorworks, or Revit model. It only takes a couple clicks from installation to creating your first rendering. Enscape does realistic renderings, 360-degree panoramas and videos, and virtual reality environment. We use Enscape and we you would love it too so click the Enscape 3d link in our show notes to learn more i used to start remodeling projects with hours of tedious measuring and recreating the existing conditions then i discovered canvas an ipad and iphone app that lets me easily scan entire homes in minutes and automatically generates editable models in formats like sketchup archicad vectorworks revit and more in as little as one day thanks to canvas i spend more time designing the future instead of measuring the past Get to the design phase faster with Canvas. Visit canvas.io forward slash SSP or click the link in our show notes to schedule your demo and get your first as built free. Fellow architects and interior designers, if you're looking for an ultra fast and robust BIM computer program for your office, then check out ARCHICAD. ARCHICAD leads the industry by enabling architectural and interior design firms around the world to freely design, supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. ARCHICAD is also always evolving and advancing, which allows designers to push that technology to their advantage while working in an accurate model. So start your fully functioning free trial today by clicking on the ARCHICAD link in our show notes. This is the second studio with myself and Marina. Here we go. This week it's the two of us in the studio and we are doing a long awaited project companion episode. And this week we're talking about uh, some of our favorite pet peeves in architecture and design and uh, oftentimes houses, but just architecture and design in general. So the first one we have on our list is poorly adapted historical styles or elements, such as, for example, shutters. There is, I think that's probably one of my personal biggest pet peeve, is when things try to look like something else else that used to be at a different time and space and, and place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so shutters, for example, if you are a foreigner coming from, let's say, European countries, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Europe, people have shutters on their houses, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's been like that for like centuries. Um, if you move to the United States, you live here, you look at people who have shutters, you will notice that they don't quite look right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that I don't have so much problem with um, ornamental elements in on, on, on architecture, like on facades and things, if it contributes to the identity of the building, the design, enhance things like, you know, like beauty is a good goal to have, and, you know, in design. So I'm fine with that. But things still need to make sense. All right. So shutters is one of the ones thing that it, so here don't make sense. So what's wrong with the shutters here? So if you look at most shutters here, like exterior shutters, right? Yeah. The one you see on facades in like suburban settings when you're driving by neighborhoods. Um, if you actually look at, first of all, how they're installed, okay. you will find out that a lot of them are just securely fastened to the facade. There is no hinge. There is no way they can move. They're fixed. Mm. Those are not shutters. Mm -hmm. But they're taking the way they look, they're taking the persona of what a shutter looks like. Mm -hmm. But it's not a shutter because you can't shut it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 So that's one thing is the way it's mounted, there is no hinge, it's not moving. It's just a piece of panel that's meant to represent a shutter, but it's not. And it's kind of like, what are we doing? Are we building like movie sets? And like mm -hmm. you don't see a detail, it's no big deal, but if it's like a real life house and neighborhood, and you're gonna spend the money to put it up there and it was intended to be used in a certain way, but now it's just becoming a decorative element mm -hmm. that is obsolete. 
it's, it, it, it seems useless to me. So you don't like it when shutters are fake shutters and they're fixed? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're trying to add ornamentation to your house, which at this point is what that fake shutter is, there is other things you could do than putting shutters that don't shut. Gotcha. Right? The other thing oh my, another. on the shutters that really honestly pisses me off is their size. So if you pay close attention, and I've seen that many times <laughs> all over California specifically, <laughs> you would see giant windows like, you know, I don't know, like four or five feet wide and a 12 inch shutter on the side of it, on, the, on both sides. So you have two. But if you were, and sometimes they have even the hinges in this case, but if you were to try and close them, <laughs> You will close like a fifth of the window width. So <laughs> again, fifths, yeah. it's not a shutter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's so bad that let's say you have an arched window, yeah. but the shutter is a rectangle. <laughs> I'm like, really? Like you just ran to the store, bought that shutter, stuck it on there. I didn't even think about it. So, uh, it, I mean, I think it comes back to, again, maybe being honest in in the process of design and, and what you are putting into the buildings and the houses you live in yeah. and the meaning of them. Um, you know, if it's just to put shutters, to have shutters, but you actually don't understand what a shutter is for, uh, maybe you don't need it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's it's just, I don't know, just maybe honest and being critical. I mean, one might assume because you do modern and contemporary work that you'd be dismissive of shutters and... I love this... shutters. I think they're awesome. Okay. You know, and like, especially in like hot summer time, you can keep your house much cooler if you have sh exterior shutters that you can close during the day to keep your house like cool, yeah. right? It's much better than having like drapes on the inside or like, it's you know, like, to... it's, it's more effective yeah. to the heat. So I love shutters. I grew up with shutters and we use them every day. It's just those are not shutters. <laughs> well, I think the the broader statement is the misuse of historical styles, yeah. objects, or aesthetics, and just kind of transplanting things haphazardly. And at some point, when you have the original thing, it could be an entire style of building or one thing like a shutter, and you strip away its meaning more and more and more, then you end up with something that's very, like you said, dishonest or inauthentic. And I don't really know what we're doing at that point. And I think that's exactly what happened, right? Shutters were invented and, and put in place for what? To protect you from bad weather, like snow, storm, hail, you know, protect your windows from like cold winters, hot summers, from mm -hmm. people breaking into your house for like closing from the daylight to be able to sleep during the day or, or at mm -hmm. night, right? And if you remove the function from the element and just look at them just from a, an aesthetic point of view and stick it on the building, that's where they fall apart. Like, I don't think you can do that unless maybe the element was always intended to be just an, let's call it an ornamentation on the building. I think you could look at a more traditional house that has shutters, one that exists and let's say was designed or built in the 1600s or the 1400s in the case of France and look at it and say there's something beautiful about it with the proportions with and and, and part of what makes it aesthetically pleasing is the shutters is the trim is the cornices is the columns is all these other things and then figure out how you can create the same feeling and emotions in a contemporary way that seems to me a more productive way of going about that process rather than just like I'm gonna take random bits very haphazardly without thought without care and that's the thing too i think one of the reasons why you and probably a lot of architects really despise these fake shutters that aren't even the right size is because part of it is that we are trained to take five different constraints and find a solution that satisfies all of those constraints um, in this case the two that are the most obvious are function and beauty and there's other ones as well um in architecture in general and so when we see something that is just like just doesn't care just yeah, disregard yeah. for the complexity of what architecture Not is it seriously. then it's it's actually it's a visceral response of almost uh, anger by a lot of architects because you know whoever did it is not good at their job or yeah. they're not an architect and it's an insult you know, if you take the profession seriously, it's an insult to the profession. Yeah. It's like, what, what are you, what are you doing? What are we doing here? Um, but to, to I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. No, I was just going to say that I, yeah, like I said, we focus on the more modern or contemporary type of yeah. work, but it doesn't mean we don't like historical things. I so so like sometimes clients will call and say, "I'm thinking of this kind of house," and I have to explain to them, "Well, have you seen our work? We don't do." 
you know, this other type of uh, classical work. Now, the only realm in which, the only case where I would entertain the idea of doing a more traditional house is if it was done truly authentically. Yeah. Then I would find that very interesting because we're learning about uh, construction methods, materials, why things are put together a certain way, and the styles, but in a very authentic manner. What I don't do, and what I will never do, is take a style and, again, just sort of take the veneer of it and just yeah. slap it on the side of something, yeah. unless there's some kind of architectural critique being made, which is a more conceptual thing which we're not going to get into. But otherwise, it just feels, you know, wrong. <laughs> so it does. And it, I mean, like you said, like it's it's an insult. It's disrespectful. Mm. Um it's yeah, it's just not great. But to to make a twist of those the shutter conversation, because true shutters are known in more uh, historical architecture, you know, local vernacular, all the places and this and that. However, I would be super interested to see the use of shutters on modern architecture, because I do think that there is a lot of like you know sustainability aspect thermal and and, and safety yeah. performances associated with it and you know like california like we're big with like the low e the title 24 the energy and all of that stuff but honestly a simple a simple solution to that is to have exterior shutters and yeah. you know not have giant glass walls everywhere so i would be super interested to see in modern architecture architects looking at those historical things and seeing like how they can be adapted to, you know, more modern contemporary building because I do think that, again, they're very good and there is ways that they could be implemented and they could bring character to uh, a facade. The interesting you know? thing about shutters, so we've, I've, I've, I've done things that have elements like that, mm -hmm. but when you look at the shutter as it is traditionally, you know, it's a swing operating um, panel basically with kind of blinds, let's call them yeah. louvers, right? Uh, but you break down what it's doing, then you can take the specific aspects of its performance and then recreate those performances in a different manner. So the shutter might not swing anymore, or maybe it comes up and down, or it slides, or maybe yeah. you do feel like part of the the identity or the the nature of shutter, the essence of shutter, is the swing operation. So you put that into the design. I mean, it opens up the possibilities. Like recently, as we said, I think a few weeks ago, we were in Switzerland. And what's cool about that country and probably others in Europe is they have exterior blinds. It's very, very common. And at, at what point is our blind shutters versus uh, louvers, I, I'm not quite sure, or brisole, but exterior blinds. Lines. As in the United States, we have the cheap metal aluminum profiles <laughs> that like break after a few months. Um, they have those in Switzerland, but they're on the outside and they're bigger and thicker, so they don't break. And they're motorized. And they're motorized. And it, in terms of a architectural aesthetic detail, a design detail, it does something, right? Yeah. Because you have a facade that is constantly shifting depending on the user's inside. So there is also something very interesting. Like again, I grew up in a house with shutters, and it. The, the, it becomes part of your lifestyle. Like there is a time where you go and you close all of the shutters of your house. Yeah. You know, like when the sun goes down, like you, you close it off. I have to say that it was very weird for me to move to the States and live in places where there was no shutters because you don't feel that feeling of like safety, darkness, you know, or comfort openness. or openness. Yeah. It's that, that's, that layer doesn't exist. It's, it's very. I like that point. Weird. So. This actually dives into some of the thinking that takes place for us in the design process, right? We'll look at a very specific element and understand the characteristics of it as a mechanical thing, performance thing, but also the in the story of, of living in, in the place or working the place, whatever the building is that we're doing. And the action of, you know, when you wake up, the sun is out mm -hmm. and you open the shutters that's a very specific sensation that's happening and you're kind of opening yourself and you're starting the day, right? It's a signifier that Eureka, the day has come, right? In in any movie, like I mean, this is the American, you know, child in me, like Beauty and the Beast or who or uh Nightmare Before Christmas, when they open up the shutters, right? And it's an announcement to the world that you're awake, the world is awake, the day's gonna start. And there's definitely an emotional component to that, to what it feels like to 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 live. And at the end of the day, like you said, it's the opposite. You close. It's time to rest. It's peaceful. Yeah. It's whatever else. I had the same feeling when I was a kid, not with shutters because we didn't have shutters, but with our garage. 
um, which we can talk more about garages in a second. <laughs> but my childhood house had a garage that sort of faced the street, but it was perpendicular to it. So it wasn't like totally front facing. But um, on the weekends in particular, the first thing we would do, well, we had to do, you know, a gardening, which I despise, but you would open the garage. The garage was not some fantastic architectural thing. It was just a typical, you know, aluminum folding uh, garage system, like, like not nothing special. But when you do that, it tells uh, yourself and all of your neighbors that I'm awake now. It's the weekend. Let's yeah. talk to each yeah. other. Let's have this conversation. And then other garages open up and there's a sense of 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 there's a story and kind of a, a component to life with that yeah. right and so i think all that type of conversation is actually the things we talk about in the office like when we have this one thing it's a wall it's a door it's a shutter it's a window it's the flooring it's a ceiling what are the the stories that we are familiar with and have felt personally and then through studies and whatever else that come about because of these things and then you abstract it and make it into what it needs to be for the project. And I think that's a very powerful way of approaching uh, design. I mean, I, I, I like that part of it as opposed to just being fascinated with the geometries of shutters and whatnot. Yeah, and it's interesting how those just, just few minutes, you know, during the day, like like you said, like influence your life, your lifestyle and like are markers of your decisions or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very true. Like it could be, um, you know, noon on a Saturday, your shutters are closed. You have no idea what time it is outside, mm. but now you wake up, you have decided that it is now the time where your day is starting, mm -hmm. which is a very different thing than waking up with the sunrise and having no shutters and the sun decides when it's time for you to get up. Like, yeah. Those are kind of, you know, different ways of, of living. Going even further into, we might not get through all 10 pet peeves. Going further uh, into the shutter conversation, the other thing that it reminds me of is the operability of architecture and houses, right? Yeah. And architecture, uh, even though most of the time it's a fixed static thing, is also a living and changing thing because of the way we use it and in the case of shutters and other elements because it's actually moving. Yeah. And I think there is something, some there's some validity to um, designs that express the nature of living in that there are things that go off and on and somewhere between those two. And I, for me personally, if we were to talk about preferences, I find that as, a, as an aspect of architecture to be really interesting, as opposed to just saying architecture is fixed and we don't really care about the, we don't care about how the usability and the actual living that takes place in architecture, how can that inform architecture and be expressed in it? Like, I like that relationship, and I'm not a huge fan of just ignoring it. I don't no, think that's... That, and I think also, like, the whole, like, home automation systems, where everything is smarter than you are and yeah. adapts before you even notice it needs to be adapted. Like, those are great, but, I, I, I yeah, I, I do agree with you. Like, I think the interaction between the human and the building is super important. Like... You know, let's say you're in your home office and it's a hot summer day and it's like really bright because your room is white, right? <laughs> and you kind of need to like just dim the light a little bit. Well, maybe you have some blinds and you like close them halfway and you twist them halfway or maybe it's just one side at this time. Later in the day, you open it up and that changes the mood of, of the light in the space. And yeah, maybe like a Lutron system could just adjust your down lights or maybe like an automated sunshade could do that for you. But I feel like it's not always that scientific, you know, there is more like how you're feeling that day. Do you feel like you want True. more light or do you feel like you want to feel more cozy? Are you tired because you had a really bad night of sleep and therefore you need like more light to wake you up? And there is that, I think that level of, of human sensibility that automation or fixed architecture cannot provide. So you do, you do need to allow those modalities to be able to happen, um, yeah. I think. The other aspect of shutters, we just do a podcast about shutters, <laughs> that I think is interesting from a facade standpoint is the impact it has on the aesthetics of the, fa of the facade when they are open. So again, yeah. we were in Switzerland recently and we were walking around during the day in <laughs> an historic downtown, I think in Zurich or Bern or I don't know, we visited a bunch of towns and cities. And a lot of them are, you know, five stories, uh, residential structures. The first level is a shop or cafe. Then you have four levels of houses or I guess you call them apartments or 
condos or whatever above yeah. it, flats, and they all have square or rectangular windows. You know, these are old buildings. They're not new ones that have massive floor ceiling glazing that expand from left to right all the way to the width of the building. Like they're punched openings, as you might imagine, and they all have shutters. And when the shutters are open during the day, as, as they are, um, it, it, it the facade becomes, I don't know, five times more interesting because of the shutters. If you imagine that same building, and I'm not, these are not like, you know, uh, landmark buildings. This is an average building I'm talking about. If we're, if you removed all the shutters, that building would look absolutely like nothing. It would look boring and kind of gross. But the shutters add a level of detail, uh, proportion, scale, um, you know, decoration, uh, color. You know, it's all of these things from this one element. And... Um, yeah, it's funny. As we were there, I was like, if, if you imagine there's no shutters, this building would be horrible. I wouldn't even be, I wouldn't be photographing this uh, plaza if all these buildings did not have shutters. But it's interesting because also, as uh, you mentioned scale, and that's an interesting one. I mean, if you do have sh like true shutters and they are operable, and let's say they are like swing shutters, you know, like on the on the hinges, there is a, only a certain size shutters you could do before you have to walk three feet to close the door, right? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, again, designing with shutters would make you think about what is an appropriate size for a human in this specific location on this floor of this age, you know, to close those or not. Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, just stucking like the biggest window you could find and, and just, you know, make that your facade. Yeah. Like there is a bit, of, again, the more question, the more wondering, the more uh, you have to make decisions and think it through. Mm -hmm. I think the better the design in general ends up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, of course, obviously, since we are in California and a lot of the work we do is here, but not always, um, <clears throat> the different climates impact your decisions. Like of here, course. we can afford to, depending on how you do it, have massive glazing almost without an issue because the weather is so temperate. And we don't need to have the ability, we don't need to have really small openings. We can have quite large ones without an issue. In other climates, it would be very, you could do it. It does happen, but it would be kind of irresponsible because it would be so hot that you'd ha you'd have to have giant, uh, at that point they're not shutters, like giant louver systems, or you would be blasting air conditioning the entire time as a lot of people do. Yeah. All right, oh, that's 20 minutes of shutters. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, you know, we don't have to go through all 10. I mean, was there anything else on the list of historic... Um, you know, architectural styles oh, and elements yeah. that are... Oh, yeah, I mean, are... you know, it's like if you go down the list of like classical architecture and you see like dory columns on one-story houses and the roof is flat or something, it's kind of like, what are we doing here? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I love... I love historical buildings. I love old buildings because of where I'm from. I also love movies and and movie sets and making things and, and making things out of nothing and mashing things together. Again, I think it needs to come down to being truthful, being tasteful, being critical. And whenever I see things just stuck on, on places, like it's just not. Well, the thing is oftentimes is just a lack of care. Yeah. That's the, for me, and, and, and that's more of a, you know, how do you, like, how do you quantify, yeah. Or like if you go down the list, okay. if you go on the other side of the shutter, if you go inside, Okay. And you see, I've seen that several times, and I want to put my 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 hair off my head. Uh, the the curtain rods, like the shades yeah. for windows, and you see like a big window on the interior, like a living room, let's say, and you have two uh, curtain tracks. Yeah, you know, curtain rods on either side. They are also each eighteen inches wide. <laughs> <laughs> With full on, you know, drapery that goes down to the floor. Yeah, and you look at it. And you're like, okay, first of all, why is the rod split in two? Right. Why is the rod only 18 inches wide? When again, your window is five feet wide. Two rods for one window. One on either side. But the, the, but the, the curtains could never be closed because they okay. can't move. The rod is just filling the curtain when it's open and that's it. Yeah. And I've seen that a few times and I, I really don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I'm get like, it either. At that point, just paint them on the wall, yeah. you know? like. Well, so that's what I've been saying, too. I think the reason why it upsets me and, and other architects like that so, that so much, because it tells me, let's imagine that client did hire a designer or an architect. Uh, you know, that person's a phony. What are you, what are you doing? It's a phony. There's, and... there's a, a complete lack of understanding f of, of 
of our of our, of our architecture. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, and the truth too is that you were that close to just get the full use of those <laughs> curtains. You could have bought that extra three yeah, three foot you. length of rod and yeah. actually be able to use your curtains. So it's like you're just like a quarter step away from actually being able to make it work. A quarter step so, in material, but miles away in terms of understanding of design. That's the, that's know, the thing. Uh, there's something else I was going to say. Yeah, I, it's um, you were talking about just paint it. And um, it go, again, going back to Switzerland, because we were there recently, there, there's these plazas in Lucerne. Yeah. Um, and they called them the painted plazas. Painted squares. Painted squares. The square is another name for kind of a plaza. And um, uh, in a lot of cases, the four-ish build uh, facades, no, not four, the four sides to the plaza, which, you know, defined by architecture and buildings, those facades are painted. So, and if you remove the paint, there would be, like, again, you would never photograph it. You'd never stop and look yeah. at it. There wouldn't be anything. You just, you're just painting stuff on the building. I guess the point is you can do anything in architecture and design and have it be valid, but there has to be reason and intention behind it, yeah. right? In the case of those painted facades, I'm not a historian. I didn't bother to look up and find out why they did that, but it was done with intention, right? It's purposeful. They're owning the fact that we're painting the facade to achieve X, Y, and Z, Z things, to state these things, whatever else. They're not trying to be fake about it. And the issue with the shutters or the crazy curtains you're describing is that there's no intent, there's no statement being made, there's no intention. It's just, oh, it looks good, so we'll do it again. And for right, any architect or designer, that's a, that is such a shallow way yeah. of thinking about it. Um, and just a dis, again, a disregard for what things were. To, to jump on you know, the, the painted square and the painted facade, um, it's very interesting when you think about it because, you know, back like centuries ago or whenever, painting images on building was a big thing. Yeah. You know, like inside churches and cathedrals used to all be painted yeah. with like scenes and, mm -hmm. and things, right? And that kind of went away, but it's interesting because we're still very much fascinated by images you know, despite all of the centuries between when those cathedrals and, and, and facades were do, painted to today. Do you mean it fascinated by images on Instagram or images well, on buildings? Well, so nowadays, like, we're fascinated by images on our phone and devices. Mm -hmm. We're still fascinated by the image, right? But the image became, like, detached from the buildings, let's say. But it's interesting that I don't know when, at what point we decided that it wasn't okay to paint on buildings anymore, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's, I find it, I don't know, I find it very interesting that you would use the scale of the buildings, which is huge, to tell stories and or signify what the building is about or who it is for or something like that through like graphic, you know, uh, um, visual images yeah. and not just... Um, three-dimensional yeah. elements um, yeah. I, I find it very fascinating and you know you still have people who like do graffitis and like you know full-size murals on, on buildings but it's not part of the architecture yeah. anymore it's just you use the architecture as a canvas but it's not it doesn't come with the building yes yeah you know? yeah absolutely well my, my 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 terrible memory with architectural history I think that it's those paintings existed because they, they actually told a real story. They were story. teaching something They were to teaching people. something, yeah, right? Yeah, that's my understanding, too. Um, and at some point, as culture evolved and society evolved, we moved away from, the, from those stories as Pretty truths, books, and that was right? That, yeah. So we don't need them on buildings, and then it caused you to question, like, what's the point of... Like, the orders in, in classical architecture were invented by somebody, and they had reason, they had meaning for, for whatever reasons, and then as a society, we move beyond that. We're like, well, that's not really like the universal truth anymore. We don't have a universal truth that we're, everything has to abide by the five classical columns and the five orders or whatever it was. And then architecture gets to a point where now we're like, okay, well, what do we do to find a <laughs> meaning? Because meaning used to be tied to iconography and text and paintings and all these things, but that's not the case. And a lot of it has ties to obviously Christianity. Uh, that's not the case anymore in, well, a, in a modern world. And so what do we do? And, what that's... And, and now I think it's more, more than often just tied to function. Yeah. You know, which... Well, func fu the function, because it's a very easy thing for people to understand, for clients to understand, for the people who are paying for the building to understand function. Yeah. And then there's that, and then there's just basically subjective aesthetics. Oh, I like that. I don't like that. And those in, in a... When there's not a good architect or a good client, that ends up being... 
the only things that dictate what the building is. And that's when you end up with these shutters and these curtains and don't whatnot. Make any sense but I but that's the thing, right? I think that doing a building where there is some large graphic on it that's two dimensional, i.e. it's painted, is totally fine and it's legitimate if there's some kind of purpose behind it. And, you know, go even further, I would say having a building where shutters are not functional under the wrong size, there could also be a very, you know, good building that's validated that does that too. If there's, there's some kind of architectural critique or concept in mind, but that's not the case, you know, with these buildings that we see in LA or San Francisco, they're just nonsense. <laughs> it's just nonsense. It's like, well, I had some extra shutters from another project. Let me give, give them to you yeah. and stick it on there. I do feel though that you were saying, you know, our, um, but yeah, painting painted facades as opposed to always relying on three dimensional components, and that's one of the common limits that modernist place on themselves when they shouldn't is their approach is well we we cannot use iconography we cannot oh. use decorative items we cannot use uh, painted graphics as a way to to design a building we cannot use elements that are abstracted you know versions of once functional things like shutters we have to be pure the materials have to be the only way that we communicate decoration is through the material choice is is through the 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 sculpture of the building and um honestly i think that's kind of limiting i think you can do more than that i don't know why because that's also a a kind of dogmatic or limited approach to to architecture you know it can only be pure with the materials know, you can do things that are are wacky and you know don't abide by that rule set I think it's harder to do because not there's not much precedent for it, right? Like we yeah. kind of like somehow all follow this invisible rule guide rules um, that, that guidelines, yeah. guidelines that you know um, someone made up at some point, uh, and therefore if you try to deviate from it or do something that's kind of like out of the way, it's more of a risk because there's a risk it's not going to turn out very good or it's going to take you more time to figure out and make it look good. Mm. But it is interesting, yeah, and I do think that we are oftentimes limiting ourselves, like everybody and everything we do, because of the way things are done. And um, yeah, it'd be more interesting to. I would love to see a, a more contemporary building have like, like images painted on them, you know, in a way that is truthful to the architecture and actually makes sense for what they're trying to accomplish, um, because there is something powerful to it. You yeah. know, like when we were in those painted squares and you see those giant murals and the colors and and trying to understand the story, the meaning. I mean, you know, you go to a museum, you stare at painting on a white wall for hours because you're trying to understand things without having anyone telling you what it is about, right? Mm -hmm. And I wish people were doing that with buildings a lot more besides architects. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just just having something to look at and wonder and questions and think and, and admire. I mean, at some point, it also is it's just a matter of whether or not the building is a good building <laughs> well, yeah, of true. whatever it is. And now a quick break to thank the sponsors who support the second studio. If you're starting to laser scan your renovation projects for accurate as-builts, you'll want to hear this. Imagine that you've been awarded a big project, but not surprisingly, your client hands over wonky CAD drawings from 17 years ago. No worries. Meet Integrated Projects, or IPX for short. IPX is a scan-to-BIM platform that converts your 3D point cloud file, which is produced from any major LiDAR camera, into standardized BIM and CAD files. The best part is that they lay out the price and turnaround time instantly. That means starting your interior renovation project on the 50-yard line with an accurate set of drawings in 3D and 2D. Click the IPX link in our show notes to launch the platform for free. The Second Studio Podcast is made possible by support from Autodesk. Autodesk has been part of the design conversation since 1982, providing the tools that help architects around the globe imagine and create beautifully designed, memorable buildings that people love and admire. Autodesk supports the work of the second studio, bringing the architecture community together, sparking curiosity, and leading vibrant interviews with the industry's visionaries and thought leaders. The second studio works hard to carry the architecture conversation forward, and Autodesk is proud to contribute to this podcast. Learn more about Autodesk by clicking the link in our show notes. Spreadsheets can't bring your designs to life, but Programma can. Say hello to a bespoke integrated software suite built by and for experienced architecture and design professionals. 
Use your Pinterest image library to build collaborative mood boards, then turn them into shared online presentations with a click using Programma's pin boards. Use the Programma Web Clipper to build a centralized specification library for your studio. Share always up-to-date specifications and product schedules with clients, trades, and colleagues by generating beautiful, branded, live links and client dashboards. Programmer's clean, minimal interface allows your work to shine. Start for free and save 25% on annual plans at programma.design slash second studio. All right, hit us. Pet peeve number two. Okay, the other one, which this might be the only one other pet peeve we get to today, <laughs> is an inconsistent use of materials throughout a house or a project. Okay. And what I mean by that is, and, and this is something that maybe non-architects don't know about architects and architecture, is that in general, when you go to design a building, uh, let's say it's a house, there's you are basically creating an, an alphabet for that house and a vocabulary for that house, and then you're employing that throughout the entire design. And that language that you've created, uh, sometimes for some offices, is incredibly consistent from one project to the next, and that becomes their stick or style or yeah. whatever the signature and other times it's different from project to project but the point is that every project has a rule set for itself that it has to follow which is i think how you create something that's beautiful there's a logic to it even if that logic is only for that one project and disobeys all other logics for other projects and other architectures and one of the ways that that rule set um is is conveyed in the final architecture is to use materials in a consistent way. So if I have a project and I have, um, let's say marble, okay? And marble is used in this particular element in the house and in a certain manner. It's not just by the element, but it's also the shape, the thickness, the weight, how we move around it, the set, like everything about that marble in this situation, in this one corner of the house, defines something about that marble. And later on, I use that marble somewhere else in a completely different manner. And then I do it again in a completely different manner. And I'm just using marble, again, wherever I just feel like it. And there's not, and it's not following that rule set or the vocabulary of the house. That's when it's a problem. So that's also the difference, I think, between like good architects and designers versus bad ones and, and projects where there's, or there aren't any. You will step into a house that's like, um, was designed by... A poor architect a bad architect and um, it might have the nicest materials it might have onyx marble polished nickel brass trim it might have all this all the ingredients of what you would think to be a really fantastic nice house by today's standards but when the materials are just thrown like wherever they want them the creators the, whoever it is they go well i think it would look here so i put it here well i think the the onyx will look good here so i put the onyx there oh, i think i want some brass here so i put brass there that's when it becomes a shit show and yeah. that's something that that's um so like when we're walking into houses and we're critiquing them just naturally we're critiquing everything that we see that's one of the first things that makes it very clear as to whether or not it was designed by a good architect a designer or it wasn't is the 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 consistent or proper use of materials for what that project is doing versus just materials anywhere and everywhere based on the whims of these, the subjective whims of whoever thinks it looks good. I would say materials and even details. Details, you that's true. You know, I mean, true. like if you go to the Versailles castle, while well, there is a lot of stuff going on in every room, but it's pretty consistent still in like the, the way things are being detailed yeah. and like things are being approached, right? If you imagine a house where you have like, I don't know, reveal base, and then you have like five inch wall base in another room and you have like, you know, uh, ceiling trims in one space and then reveal and pa drop panels in another one. Like, yeah. you, you, you can't do that. It's it's not doing a showroom. It's trying to be something that has a, a consistent the, thread. The showroom is, is, an, is an analogy we use often when we're talking to clients of, like you don't want it to look like a showroom or the house, that house we saw does feel like a showroom. Like you're just throwing in a bunch of stuff that's cool, right? Yeah. And that's not design. That's just being... I don't know what it's like you ask a kid to or homer simpson to design the car of the future i think there's an a simpsons episode and he basically just threw together all the stuff he'd ever want in a car and it produced this like horrible thing yeah. 
<laughs> but think about it, it's like food, you know? right? Like you like strawberries, you like chocolate, you like exactly. blue yeah, cheese, you like Nutella, you like all those things. You just throw, you throw it, together. it in together. It's disgusting. No, you can't do that, though. You can't like, do that. You, you can't. Um, so that's something that I see very often, super often. I think it's hard to, especially when you work with, let's say, clients on residential projects, because clients sometimes are very excited about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a house, uh, if it's your house, your forever house, it's your one chance to get all the things that you ever wished for. And <laughs> I feel like it's, it's yeah. I mean, it is our job as, as architects and designers to try and kind of like make sure that the recipe tastes good in the end, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe use some of those wish list elements, not everywhere, not in the same amount. Uh, maybe just sprinkle them in a few places to satisfy the client's desire, but also make sure that at the end it makes sense. And it's a very, you know, it's a difficult exercise because you have to, you have to understand the client, you have to understand who they are, you have to communicate to them why something is good, why something is bad. You have to be good at design to accommodate all, a lot of different things to work yeah. together. Um, but I mean, to be honest, but it's also what's exciting. I mean, you know, yeah, and to be honest, it just depends on the client, right? Like we're fortunate that most people we work with, they get it, and that's why they've hired us. Yeah, it's like because they want to actively know. This is more in talking about client and architect relationships. Like architects are often complaining, oh, clients don't understand. You know, <laughs> they're asking for this, but it doesn't make sense, and whatever. And it's like, look. <clears throat> Of course they don't understand. They, they're not an architect. Yeah. Of course they're going to ask you questions that to you doesn't make sense. It's out of order. It's not the right phase. It's a dumb idea. Of course. Like you, like if you expect otherwise, then then you're an idiot, right? Yeah. So of course they're going to ask those. And they should be asking those questions. It, it, it tells you that they're engaged and interested. And then secondly, um, you know, you, you have to, instead of just dismissing them or becoming angry, if you take the time to just explain to them why... Uh, what they're suggesting does not make sense. Um, if, if it doesn't, most clients in our experience are like, "Oh yeah, that's 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 yeah. what I want to know. I want to know that." Actually, almost the, all the clients we have currently, they've told us at the outset, um, like, "I'm going to tell you a bunch of stuff. I'm telling you, I do not know architecture. <laughs> I want you to tell me." when it's a bad idea. They don't say, tell me when it's a good idea. They say, you tell me when this is a bad idea and we should not be doing it. They, that's what they're paying us for. Yeah. And so I find, so I think that it, it does, you know, lead into the discussion of having the right clients, but also like the architects, like you gotta work with the right people and be receptive to those comments and questions because of course they're gonna come up, you know? Yeah. And if they're good people and they're, and they're engaged, like some clients are more engaged or less engaged, which is fine either way, they're going to want to know. Like, yeah, explain to me. Oh, that's super interesting that we wouldn't do it that way because yeah. of, you know, the alphabet or whatever thing is, is being discussed. Um, because it's, uh, like you said in the recipe, it, it's, it's about the final total outcome. It's never about the individual things. And that's the mistake. And that's also the mistake, frankly, we see with a lot of, like kind of lower end designers and interior designers, they the way they design is just kind of like a wish list, a kid's wish list of the coolest things yeah. that they like as as individual items, and they just throw it together. Like wow, it's like cool eclectic. No, you're being lazy and it's sloppy. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. Come on. Well, and I would want my clients to be like, Don't do I that. love my house. Yeah. If I design a whole house, rather than I love my kitchen, but they never mention the rest of the house. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, like. Yeah. You, you uh, again. You want to satisfy the biggest part of the project, not the you know, not necessarily the smallest detail. And there is also like it's very easy in a house to look at a specific thing. Uh, let's say, well, I don't know any client who would look at a reveal and be excited, but a reveal, a material, or a chair, or whatever it is, and be excited about that thing because they like that thing. That's a very easy um, situation we can all imagine. Of course, like that has meaning to me. I like that thing. Now I have that thing. Um, but there is also the satisfaction and the joy of being in a space that is of a higher design quality that comes from partially from what I'm describing is having a clear um, aesthetic in this case, let's say a rule set and, and vocabulary that we've created for this house. That's what makes it cool. Right. Yeah. And you, you certainly feel that, but it's one of those things that's a, bit more difficult to describe because you can't point to one thing and say that's that chair that i wanted i love that chair look at it makes me feel amazing because i have that chair you it's harder to say that it's more like this house just feels good i like being in this house yeah. and that's also the difference like when clients have experienced um a properly and well-designed house they already know that feeling 
and that's what they're after. They don't have the words to describe it, but they know that sensation. And it's uh, also difficult, therefore, to express that feeling to someone who hasn't been in that quality of space. The third pet peeve that comes to my mind, uh, you know, when thinking about a house, because that's what we do. We do we do houses. Um, we've done all the things, but we do houses right now. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it's true. Well, yeah. you know, it's important to mention. Um, one thing that really upsets me is hallways. <laughs> okay. Hallways. Hallways that are, are super functional. So okay, let's, okay, what's okay. the problem with the hallway? Dead end hallways. Dead end like hallways. Like long dead end hallways. You know, when 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 you design a home and like you have to play with like all the programs, the massing, the geometries and, and, and all of that, it's it's like a giant puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you solve a puzzle by adding a long bar that connects things together, it's kind of a cheat. Interesting. It's kind of a cheat. To me, it's kind of a cheap solution to to resolving the puzzle is actually not addressing the, the not puzzling together the, the parts. Gotcha. Um, so uh, hallways to me are, especially dead end ones, especially if they are like double loaded hallways. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, you have to explain uh, to people what do you mean by dead end and what do you mean by double loaded? Okay. So if you have a house, <laughs> these are things that architects You're walking know, but... from your living room to let's say your bedroom. That's okay. usually where the hallway incident happens. Of course, the incident. It's, yeah, that's where it occurs. Of course. Right? And you look straight down, yeah. it's, a sh it's a straight shot. Maybe it's, I don't know, 10, 15, 12, 20 feet long hallway, right? Sometimes longer. I've been in houses And there is 50. nothing at the end. Nothing at the end, okay. But a blind piece of wall that's usually really sad. That's <laughs> probably about four feet wide, <laughs> yeah. eight feet tall, maybe more if you're a bit luckier. Yeah. And, th and that's it. It's like, this is a dead end. It means you're going <clears> to <throat> die at the end of it. You know? <laughs> That's what it means, yeah, really. Yeah. It's death. At the end of this is yeah. death, right? Yeah. Double loaded death hallways okay. are when you have rooms on both sides. Mm -hmm. So it's super efficient because you can walk that path toward death and enter one room on the left or one room on the right, right? Right. right. Very efficient. No, I'm sorry. That is not what architecture is. Unless it's like a magical hallway that has like skylights. Maybe there is a dead end, but there is something experiential. About or, the or, or it's designed in a way that connects the spaces throughout the hallway or something special, then maybe. But I do feel like in general, it's a, it's a cheat. It's cheap. It's, it's, it is not addressing the problem. And I do feel like as architects, we could usually do better than that. Yeah. Um, because it's about... It's not... You're basically designing a freeway. That's why you're designing. You're designing a freeway in a, in a house. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the shortest, most efficient way to get to, you know, 10 bedrooms, two bathrooms? Uh, wow. It's <laughs> a very, very efficient house. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, how could I get the quickest, the fastest, yeah. the cheapest to where I need to go? And if, you know, if that's your approach to architecture or how you want your house to be, then, you know, it's, it's all on you. I want no responsibility in that. But... If that is not the case and you care more about how you move from one space to the other or or how you might all within your family use that space at different times and, you know, at different ages and things like that, maybe that, that hallway doesn't even need to exist. Mm -hmm. You know, there is like much more um, subtle way to, to do that. There is this thought that when you're designing a, a house, a floor plan, and, and obviously it depends on the scale of the house, but let's say mid-sized, well, even some people will say this is not big, it's not small, but let's say mid-sized, let's say you're talking about like a 5,000, 6,000 square foot home, which is a good size, oh, but we're big, not huh? in the 12,000 range, oh, and we're not in the 1,200 big. range either, so I'm just picking a number. <laughs> we're in that scale, right? Um, so there's like maybe six beds, something around that matter, and probably five bathrooms, six bathrooms, not, not one bathroom. <laughs> yeah. oh, it was two for 10, big deal. Yeah. <laughs> two, 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 ten. <laughs> yeah, that's why the house it's is so European cheap. It's European size, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's just kind of this, this uh, unspoken rule that you should try and design without having a hallway for the reasons you're describing, because circulation is kind of like wasted space. Now, so that means from a space use standpoint that instead of allocating you know, four by 20, 80 square feet or whatever amount of space that is just to circulation, you're able to absorb that space into the into the rooms. So that's what a way to have a more efficient plan and a plan that's more well thought out than just having this dumb hallway that everyone defaults to, right? You don't need to be an architect or designer or professional to design a house that has a hallway in it because again, living room, hallway, 
bedrooms and baths on both sides of the hallway, then the house stops, floor plan done. And you have an entry somewhere. And a, you know, that, that's like, a, that's like yeah. the solution. Um, there is some truth to that, right? If you can figure out how to do a plan without relying on the default hallway, then you're usually on to something. At the same time, uh, to your point, you're not and we're not dismissing hallways altogether. It's more the issue again when somebody, let's say a developer, just takes a hallway and they just shove it in there as a freeway solution with no thought, that's the problem. But if that space becomes a gallery, becomes an experience because there's skylights, it becomes something else, it becomes, um, it's a hallway, yes, to could get from one place to the next, but you have, you know, glass on both sides or glass on one side, you're looking at a forest or whatever, it becomes something, yeah. right? It's offering something either functionally or oftentimes in the case of a hallway, uh, because of the nature of its uh, nature of its uh, space uh, or proportions. I mean, it's a it's a l experiential value add. But there's something that's happening there that's contributing to again the experience and the overall concept of the project instead of it just being this thing we have to have. Simp and, it's an and, inter. I think we've talked about this before. It's like this. It's one of these interstitial spaces that just there because we need it, and no one thinks about it more than that. But it doesn't have to be. It could actually be the best. And I'm saying it should be, but it could be one of the best parts of the house, right? Like very easy. It's a long pr procession. It can be meditative. It can be transformative. It can do a lot of things in a very unique space that's long and linear. That's not common. You don't really find that anywhere else in a house, right? So if you take it for, if you think about it as being an opportunity to do something special because it is a special space, then that's fine. But oftentimes it's 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 not. It's it's the uh, walk to death or whatever you said. <laughs> it's the freeway to death. Um, no, but yeah, I think it's 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 basically probably why it, it it bugs me and where I think it fails is that again it's just stripped down to pure function and has nothing else to offer mm. but you know without spending most of your construction budget into building that hallway to make it interesting there is ways to make it something special or something that that's that brings value to the rest of the house mm -hmm. and you know, if you think of like how you move and experience a, a, a home where you live you, know, you go from one space to the other it's like imagine i don't know you're visiting uh you're visiting a museum Right, and you're like in one room there is Picasso, and then you go there is Van Gogh, and then you go somewhere else, and in between the rooms you have to walk through like I don't know, like a, a space that's not finished that still have like exposed studs and and drywall, and then you enter in a marble space that had very expensive paintings, and it's kind of like it feels deconstructed. It feels like it's something a, a, a part is missing, like things are not connected well. I think mm -hmm. it's the connection between all the parts that I think a lot of people imagine that the hallway solves because it's actually physically connecting you, but meaningfully it's not, yeah. you know, designfully it's not. Yeah. So it, to me, it fails. There's, there's also this, this idea in design of the positive and the negative, um, also known as the figure and the ground in compositional design terms. And, um, the figure ground understanding of, of, of design is often employed at an urban design scale. So you think of the, the figures as being the houses or the buildings, I should say, and the ground as being, well, in that case, the ground. And you have a the, you 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 draw an urban scale map of a city, a neighborhood where all the buildings are black, and then everything else is white. So there's a figure and a ground, and you're reading the urban fabric pattern. But the same kind of thinking of of this this kind of um, these opposites and dualities and these two things that exist because of each other. But one is, a, you would think is to be more important. You think the figure as being more important than the ground um, exists also in the scale of a house. And it's often the case that we tend to think of, by we, I mean the general public, you think of the rooms as being the prominent figures, as the things that are the focus on, the, the focus, right? And the ground in this case is the hallway and the circulation. And it's just background, right? It's just there. It's only there because we need it. And we only have it because we need to get to the other, uh, you know, prominent spaces and that's just not that's just not true it's not it doesn't make sense right every space should be thought about and again i think that it's it's 
the positive twists on it. It's the hallway um, as a circulation space. It's a very unique, special thing. It's, it could be amazing. Yeah. It could actually be the essence of the house. In fact, we're doing a house now where it might be. Like that space could be, could be the spine, um, not just from a performance standpoint, but a, a feeling standpoint, the spine of the house that could have great value in terms of design and living experience and all those things. So, um, and the dead end aspect is a funny one because it's, you know, I oh, think you have a sad little picture frame at the yeah, end yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I'm yeah. like, wow, this is my goal. Is to and it's get crooked, to that, you know. Um, so post stamp right there. I think I'll, I think your description of the dead end hallway probably comes from seeing, you know, mid level te- cheap tract houses throughout California. I mean, what are you know, in France? Like, I grew up in a tiny town, suburban house built in the seventies with hallways, and it was you know. It was yeah. just one one side of the little hallways. You know, it was bedroom, 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 bathroom. Very dark. You know, as a child, it's kind of creepy because it's like yeah. it seems very big, very long. It's very dark, very intimidating. And usually the doors are closed if somebody's in it. Like it's just it's this dead part of a house, which yeah. is very strange. And a wall at the end that is very it's a very sad wall. If the wall was an emoji, to be a, a you know frowny face. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I mean, if help it was me a, a pack of Nutella or yeah. something, like there's some <laughs> sort of rewards for working that. Yeah, but something. you know, if not, yeah. But the 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 dead end aspect is is it's true, and it's kind of like if you're walking clearly in in a line toward um, an end because you're going in a line in a linear fashion, then something should happen at the end, something magical. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be. A, you know, a, a a bowl of Snickers or Nutella. It doesn't have to be a sculpture, although it, has it often to be is. Nutella. It doesn't have to be. It could be. It could be anything. But it, it it just needs to have some kind of meaning, as opposed to it being just this kind of residual space that we just don't care about, and it's there because we have to have it. So that's just why it's there. Yeah. You know, that's why again, oftentimes you find a sculpture at the end because it's the it's a valid and also easy solution, right? If you happen to have a nice sculpture and it fits at the end of the hallway, you put it there. At least now there's something. It's too sad, though. It's <laughs> depends on the sculpture, maybe. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, unless it's like a giant Jeff Koons or something. It's still really sad. <laughs> yeah, it's a big hallway. Yeah. Just one balloon, just one balloon of Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons just lift, tilted. But if someone side. in your house just would change that thing every day, it's a different thing. That could be fun. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. but yeah. All right, so now we're moving on to probably the the fourth and final pet peeve for today, which means that this will be a, a part one of two or three recordings of pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one I'll choose is, it's a pet peeve, but also I, I think it's an interesting one for, for clients to hear, is poor detailing. And you sort of said, touched on that, I think, when we were talking about something else in this recording. You said something about the details being inconsistent. I actually mean... Um, poor execution in, in construction. So all the other stuff we talked about was design related. This is about um, more about, well, it could be design, but also in this case, I'm thinking construction. So one of the ways that I also critique a house when I first enter it, like I see a lot of houses that real estate agents show me, is I look at the details, um, meaning where things meet. <laughs> and architects love this type of stuff. Where does the wall meet the floor, where the wall meet the ceiling, meet the stair, meet the tread, meet the window, all the little corners and nooks and crannies, right? I look at those for the design of those details, if they make sense, because that's a very good and easy way to look at one thing that's hyper-focused. It's easy to find, because again, you just look at a juncture between three different things. You look at that, there it is, and if the design resolved it in an elegant manner. And this is easy to, to kind of see because i'm not talking about concepts we're not talking about um you know the the aesthetic value of abstracting shutters this is very simple does that detail look like it was elegant it was solved in an elegant way or is it sloppy and messy very easy to see any any non-architect and designer can look at it can look at two details one that's poorly designed and one that's well designed and say like yeah that one's better because those details are one of the layers of architecture that differentiates probably a very high-end and good architect versus one that's mediocre because those details are really difficult to solve architect and contractor architect and contractor they're difficult to solve and also means that 
all of the big gestures might be figured out, but it takes a different, again, let's call it level of designer or, or architect to get to that point in the design, that level of detailed detailedness, right? It could also be that it's not the architect's fault. It could be that the client screwed something up and they ran out of money and they whatever, or the contractor didn't do a good job and was doing stuff without the architect. There's a lot of reasons why things don't work out. So I'm not saying it's you, you can look at that and just, just blame the architect. But that's one thing in terms of the design. And then the execution. It's also very simple to see. It's clean or it's not clean. Is there paint being transferred to the other side when it shouldn't be? You know, that's 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 a big one that really bothers paint. me. When you go in like, beautiful house, it's been remodeled or it's brand new and you see like strokes of paint on things that you're not supposed to see. And like the paint's not precise. I'm like, come on. Yeah. Like, you could just go back with a Q tip, just clean that up. <laughs> well, they would, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. make it make it clean. Yeah. So and that's simple. It doesn't take yeah. a genius to look at that, right? If you have well, that's different. If you have uh, let's say stairs and a wall, right? And the wall's painted green. There should be no green paint on the stairs, on the wood flooring, right? None. Zero. Right? Why? Because they're different things. They should not. There's oh, put a little bit there because of the brush. No, no, none, none. And um, I tend to be kind of fastidious with these things. I like perfection. But any good painter in that case, they of course like it's there's it's by in my view it's binary. It's right or it's wrong. It's green on this thing and that's it, or it's not. And if it's not right, then it's wrong. <laughs> And, but that's also the level of, of contractor, right? Yeah. It, and uh, again, it's not, the thing that's always, this is what's a pet, 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 pet peeve of mine. The thing that's always baffled me is that it's not a confusing conceptual conversation that we have to debate. You have to like learn architectural history to understand why this is right or wrong. No, it's very clear. Is the paint where it's supposed to be or <laughs> is it not, right? And what drives me nuts is if it's not, who the fuck did this? Right? <laughs> you have eyes. You can see that you didn't do a good job. Why are you doing a bad job? You know, I think people maybe care less and less about what they do in general. Meaning, like, you know, checking that your work is done correctly, feeling good about, like, what you've provided to the client that you've been hired by. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, it, it's not... It's not it's, that level of standard. I think is going lower and lower on a lot of professions. To be honest, not just design and architecture and construction. Hmm. I feel like people just care less about what they do. I would be more specific. So my interpretation of what you're saying is that people care less and less when it comes to craftsmanship. But I think the example that you mentioned, where like where things meet and stuff, is one. Yeah. You know, there is also other things like, let's say, I don't know, you have like a stone slab somewhere and like seams need to align. And, mm -hmm. you know, the architect might have put a note on the drawings, but really the fabricator is the one who handles the material and, and has probably a lot more knowledge about how things should be put together once in the field. And sometimes maybe it's because the communication between the two is not really straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, again, because on bigger projects you have to go through the contractor so it's like this other layer of communication you have to go through between let's say the architect and and the stone fabricator right mm -hmm. and if that that one part of the communication is missed maybe things won't be done the best way they could have been done yeah so there is a there is actually a lot of nuance in um in the details that can happen in a house, that is like the level of, of precision and alignment and how things are cut, how things are laid out. I mean, small things, like you, you go yeah. in a bathroom and there is tile work. Yeah. The guy who lays out the tile really care about what he does. He's yeah. gonna figure out, he's gonna lay it all out in his head or, mm -hmm. or, or physically like put each tile on the floor to figure out like which one needs to be cut, where do I start, mm -hmm. what makes the most sense. A good architect no, would put those things in, in drawings, but you know, it, it's not to say that that is exactly the way it needs to happen. If the fabricator who handles the material and knows it best yeah. has strong opinions and recommendation, I yeah. think you know that should be listened to. Uh, and that's kind of like where you see different levels of, let's say, construction and, and quality is that level of, I don't know if it's precision per se, because it's not to like the eighth of an inch cut on that tile. It's more about the level of care of the final result. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a reoccurring theme in the in this uh, the pet peeves. It's not. I, it's not even. It, it's, yeah. it's reoccurring, and I feel like that level of care from what we see really happens at a certain level of project, and it's unfortunate to see that the lower yeah. tier of projects 
don't get that yeah. because I don't think that it has to do with how expensive that tile is or that project is. It's really about does the person who's installing that tile care about what they do, you yeah. know, and like. Well, I think the reason why the high level execution of these details takes place for uh, and only in projects where there's basically wealthy clients most of the time is because somebody has to pay all these professionals to have a lot of conversations and drawing sessions to figure out these solutions to get the detail to be correct. And there is a correct way and an incorrect way. There's also, a, you know, oftentimes a cost-effective way to have a correct solution too. I'm not saying you have to, you know, be a billionaire to have these kinds of, of executions. But um, I think that's why you find it in, in higher end projects well, you find versus it because not. Because there is more at stakes. The material costs more money. So if there is a mistake, somebody's going to have to pay to fix it. That's part it, of it, too. You know? I think your point, the, what you're saying before is interesting. So uh, one thing is that these details are something to look at because in order for a detail to turn out right, a lot of work had to take place. A lot of work by the architect, the fabricator, and the contractor, and the patience of the client. And probably a bunch of other things, too. Depending so, on but, the detail. I mean, sometimes just the basic detail doesn't get done right, and it doesn't take much to get it right. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm, I'm not talking about the typical, like, baseboard meeting, you know, stair detail anymore. I'm talking about, I was thinking about a project we're working on where we have, you know, the structural element pierce, connecting to another structural element, these two beams, and then we have as an exterior thing, but it has to be cladded, and therefore, how do you deal with the waterproofing and whatever else, right? Like, in some instances, in order for this one line to be correct, to be located in the right place, to be the right distance, to be whatever, I don't know, 20 other things have to happen in order for that to take place. Yeah. And so when I step into a house and there's uh, all these details are, are, are clean and like a modern house, it takes a lot of work. And um, that's the other thing you mentioned is the difference between the architects and the people who are actually doing the work, right? Um, it's a certain uh, type of architect at a certain type of project who will bother to draw the tile pattern, the, the location of the, the seams of the marble and the countertop or the wall or whatever to figure out these construction details with the other consultants like that's a certain category of, of architect and drawing set um but even then you know to like what you said the architects like we're generalists we're not specialists we are not i'm not an aluminum welder or fabricator right so if i have a project that requires that we have to have one and i have to have a lot of conversations with them to understand the the limits of what they have in their capacity so we can design around and with that um and same thing with the tile installer so that's what i'm saying also if the, the detail turns out right in the end it's a lot of different people doing really good job and really 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 caring about it uh tile installers right there's good ones and there's bad ones and it really just comes down to ones who care and are fastidious versus ones who just like yeah let's just put up the tile and go home it's like yeah dude doesn't align though like Look at the <laughs> look at the drawings. This this grout line was supposed to align with this other line. We're not supposed to have a third of a tile floating somewhere. Like, and <laughs> that we, is and one also, thing that really bothers me. It's like, come you know, on, like you just. And it's 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 a number of things, right? One, the way we work, it's like we already talked to the contractor about this because we review with the contractor our drawings and all the details when we get to that moment. Like we talked to the contractor, they should have talked to you. A lot of times we already talked to you, the person doing it. We told we told you like it should be this way, and it's in the drawings. And and also when you're laying it out, didn't you like use your brain and see like, oh yeah, it looks really weird because we have a third of a tile floating somewhere. Like, didn't you think about like that and how to solve it? But that's the difference, right? Between a good tile installer in this case versus not, because they would stop and say, This isn't right. We have to figure out a different solution. I have to follow what's in the drawings, or when the drawings doesn't work out in reality, so let's have a conversation to find a better solution. But see, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't take much, right? Yeah. For that detail to end up wrong because it only takes one person for at that moment to be like eh we're just going to kind of skip past it and then ends up being it's incorrect. a level of care and, and paying attention i mean i remember going on site one time and the, the the stone fabricator had installed a shower floor in a in a shower space 
and there was like two different types of stone we were using and the the contractor was like really proud to show me that the stone was installed and he rips out the cover shows me the floor the walls were already done shows me the floor and my jaw dropped not because i was amazed by the installation work because i'm like man he put the wrong stone in there there is a note on the drawing that says this is the stone for the floor he used the wrong one yeah he did a great job cutting it making it work with the floor drain and all of that but that's the wrong one and it's kind of like you gotta fix it but what also what's frustrating is that construction physically demands a lot of like physical effort yeah. and time and the fact that you have to redo something because you didn't yeah. pay attention, you didn't spend that extra 10 minutes laying out your tile or double, triple checking something and you just go for it. I mean, we're talking about like mortar and like heavy stuff and it's not just like screw, you're undone and you replace. I it's know. like you got to break it, you got to take it apart, you got to reorder, you got to wait again, you got to mobilize your crew. Yep. Like, and then the next guy that comes after your stuff is and so it gets delayed and yep. it just like snowball the snowball effect of all of those micro decisions so yeah you're right this, i mean if you get that that one detail right sometimes it takes a village just to get that oh, done it always right does my goodness um, that's also why we're always saying that you client just spend the time and the relatively low amount of money to go through all of the yeah. planning the thing, and I think maybe one of the reasons why this is not um, understood or adopted as a typical process is because most, they're, they're taking the time during design and planning, is because most people don't know what construction is like. Like if you were on site uh, for half a day and you watched what it took to install this, you know, stone flooring or this stair or this, or to paint or whatever it was, you'd realize, wow. It takes a really long time to do what I perceive as an end user. One simple thing, just put in the countertop. Yeah. It takes a lot of thinking, a lot of doing, getting them yeah, to yeah, a, yeah. a lot. And you get one shot. And if you, you told know. them, look, we could, you know, prevent um, any problems by spending a fraction of the amount of construction time and adding that to design the client who if they knew construction would say that makes total sense because this is a massive and by the, by the way construction is the most expensive part right it's the biggest part of the the cost of the project so when you make a mistake it's like 10x more expensive than if we fixed it in a drawing but anyway um so yeah details so it's also a pet peeve because sometimes I go to these like amazing big houses you know in LA or in the bay area and I'm with someone and they're like wow isn't this house amazing? And there's all these people there dressed up and they're like, ooh, I'm wearing Gucci shoes. I'm in this fancy cows. Ba -ba, selfie, selfie, selfie. I'm like, no, it's shit. First of all, the design is horrible. I'm not even going to get into that. It's too long of a conversation. But just look at the details. Terrible corner, terrible, terrible corner, terrible corner, terrible corner. All poorly designed and poorly executed shit. All of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It drives me nuts. And but that's what I'm saying. Also, it's binary. It's like, but you can tell that it's bad. Do you see that? You're not an architect. I get it. But do you see how that's not clean? Yes. Well, then it's bad. <laughs> like, I. This is a complete tangent, and we'll kind of end it on here. But it it, it reminds me. Back when I was in architecture school, and this has nothing to do with with uh, you know clients and and real houses and stuff, but. We had this project and I was in an architecture studio and we were using plexiglass to make these these models or whatever. And the deal with plexiglass is that you can cut it, but it's not easy. I um, hated cutting plexiglass. It's difficult. When you cut cardboard uh, or paper, the knife, I mean, this is like really nerding out. The blade uh, kind of tracks because it bites into the grain of the material. So it tracks very easily along your straight edge, along your metal ruler, let's say. With plexiglass be, and glass also, but with, with plastic, it's so slick that your knife just kind of goes everywhere. So it's really, it's not easy to hold your knife in a perfectly straight line because it wants to slip. So we're in class, but the way you, you cut plexiglass is that you have your straight edge and you, and you score it, basically, right? And you run your blade in the same groove, maybe six times, whatever number of times. Depends how dull your blade is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, actually, a chiseled blade is best because you can carve. Um, uh, you should never use a fresh X-Acto 11 blade on plexiglass. You snap it first, and then you cut it because you're carving. And then you do the strokes, and then you snap it, and it creates a, actually a, a super clean edge. 
So I had a, a classmate of mine who was sitting next to me. He's like, you got all these clean edges. How did you do that? And I said, oh, well, you just trip the blade. You run it, you know, six times. Like, take your time. Don't use pressure. Just cut in the same line a bunch. You're making a groove, and then you snap it, and then you're done. Okay, cool. So we're both working in the studio. Then, like, half an hour, 10 minutes later, I turn around, and I look at his thing. Now, in my view, um, as someone who is somewhat detail-oriented, Right. When the instructions are to cut in the same groove six times, it means you cut, cut in, in the, the same, same groove. groove six times. This dude, he made he six cut, different grooves. He made six different grooves <laughs> and he tried to stab. He's not working. He's not working. I said, because you're not cutting in the same groove. Again, binary, bro. You, <laughs> you're either cutting in the same groove or or you're not. <laughs> I don't understand what's confusing about this. The paint belongs on that wall and nowhere else. Either it is or it isn't. There's no confusion. So did he end up paying you to cut his pexiglass in the end? No, he just had a very ragged model. It's, you know, it was fine, but again... Cut a couple of fingers on the way. Binary, and... right? Yeah. In the groove or not, the paint is where it's supposed to be or it's not. It's aligned or it's not aligned. Some people There's are no... more forceful than others, you know? There's no, there's no, there's no gray area. I, it's okay if it's yes annoying because usually it has a protective film on both sides so it doesn't get scratched until you're ready to peel it off. Mm -hmm. So it's like that film starts to come off as you start cutting the pegs. It's, it's not, it's not cool. It's not fun. <laughs> All right. So we're going to, uh, we have like another six, but we're going to stop it because we're already a bit over an hour. So I guess we'll do another recording like this at some point where we hit the other uh, few. Um, and that's it. Anything you want to say to, to wrap it up? No. Okay, cool. Give us an outro. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you do also have some pet peeves that you want to share with us, because we oh, might yeah. have some in common, yeah. uh, feel free to reach out. You can call or text our hotline, 213-222-6950. You can shoot us a DM on Instagram, Second Studio Pod. Uh, what else? We have the website, Second Studio... Hello? No. SecondStudioPod.com, <laughs> uh, where all of our episodes are. You can find us on there. And of course, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, um, mm -hmm. any podcast platform, podcast platform, we should be on there. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned and see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.